What is going on, everybody? And welcome to the Thursday edition of the Stochastic NHL Strategy Show. I am your host, Josh Harris. If I'm a little bit choppy, it is super windy outside, and I am in rural northwest New Jersey. So good for me, bad for my internet. So if I'm choppy, I apologize. Hopefully it will clear up. Bless you. Thank you. Got the uh, the El Nino winds getting cliffy. Bless you. Uh, be honest, um, not from a show perspective. Like I always prepare for the shows 100%, and I wouldn't come on if I wasn't ready to give you the best analysis that I can. But I have hit a little bit of a wall playing my normal volume on DFS. It feels like the dog days of August right now, if it's an MLB reference. So we're just getting, like, Cliffy made a, had a tweet the other day. The NHL season is longer than the MLB season, and they play half the games. It's just like, condense it a little bit, my friends. What's going on, Cliffy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just... I just found it weird because, you know, we've had long regular seasons in recent memory, but because, you know, teams would have to take a week off because of um, like COVID pauses or whatever, like this is a completely normal year. They started on time. October 10th was the first day of the season. And we're going to April 18th. Like quite literally the MLB season will have been a month old by the time the NHL regular season finishes. It does remind me of basketball um, when, they bring in, when they bring in all the franchises and the broadcasters have like their laundry hanging up behind them because they've been broadcasting the playoffs for like seven months. Like it, it kind of <laughs> reminds me of that. And I get the like I, I think the NHL PA negotiated it like to get more time off during the season. Like not only do teams get a bye week, but there are there are like three, four, five times a year where teams will have four or five days off between games, which is not something that was a thing like five years ago. Um, so more time off between games should theoretically keep players healthier, make for a more exciting product. Like most of the games are still really good. It's just, I kind of agree. Like we're at the point now, you know, maybe Minnesota makes a run in the West. But they're three points back, and Vegas has two games in hand on them. So that feels like the West is wrapped up. It's just a matter of seeding. Now there is a playoff race in the East. But, like, half the league doesn't have anything to play for. And that includes some of the top teams that have, you know, that are locks for the playoffs. Like, five, like with five weeks left in the – four weeks now, but, like, a week ago, it was, like, five weeks left in the season with half the league with nothing to play for. It's – at that point, I, I think if they fix – we do have 11 games to get to. I don't want to run too long. <laughs> if they fix the point system and go to a 3-2-1 system, three for a regulation win, two for overtime or shootout, one for overtime or shootout loss, it would make things more interesting because even though Minnesota is only three points back right now, because of the two games in hand, it feels like they're not going to get over the hump. But like Minnesota, St. Louis, even like Calgary, maybe Seattle because they do have a few games in hand. In a 3-2-1 system could theoretically make a run for a Western Conference playoff spot, but they really don't have a chance now because of the loser point because you only get two for a win. I like If they change that, I think it would make the final six weeks of the season a lot more interesting. It's just not right now. Yeah, three-point games are just death for playoff races. Uh, and I don't know, shootouts are stupid, but it is what it is. I mean, we do have 11 games to get to. Did play last night. I tempted fate. I asked uh, Daily Deposit Frostback who he was uh, playing in net, and I happened to be playing the same guy. I was like, you know what? The Leafs are frauds. They're fraudulent enough to let Daily Deposit Frostback have a decent night. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Charlie Lincoln gives up seven goals. And so I'm never doing that again. You got Tyler on, on, on Twitter just going absolutely nuts about about Lindgren, how he's making the list or whatever. And here I am like an idiot playing the same goalie. And then we have people in the Discord like Clayton who's like, you know what? I'm smart. I'm smart because Daily Deposit Frostback is like, I'm playing Lindgren. And then Clayton was like, you know what? I'm playing the Leafs. And you know <laughs> what he did? Took down the four check for $1,000. You know what Jake did? Took down the 15 for $10,000. And here I am like a moron playing Charlie Lindgren with – Daily deposit frostback. 
we have hit the dog days of August <laughs> in the yeah. NHL. Day. Yeah, I mean, you, you got to shout out uh, Clayton winning. He had uh, the Leafs, plus he had Los Angeles too um, in his lineup. And then Jake took his down with the Leafs and Logan Stankoven in his lineup. So Dallas three, Los Angeles two, got a couple, well, still, Jake's not a stochastic member. <laughs> he works there. Um, but got a couple stochastic players to the top of the leaderboards last night. Always nice when some of our favorite lines help out other people because they certainly haven't been, haven't been helping us out recently. Yeah. And it was nice to see Jake actually get a win because he's had a good season. The amount of second and third place finishes just insane for him. Like he's had an unbelievable season and it's not that great because of the thin razor margins of him not finishing first. Like he could be cleaning up this season, still having a good season, but like, Winning the 15 is apparently really hard. Let's get into this slate. I kind of like this slate. There's no Colorado on the slate, which automatically makes it better because you don't have to decide whether you want to commit 58% of your salary to a line that's going to get you 120 DK points. So that's nice off the bat. Um, yeah. Before we get into it, just want to say thank you guys again for the affiliate link support, the super chats, all that, sh all that shenanigans all these shenanigans, just sharing it, being in the Discord. You guys are a very wholesome community. Um, we appreciate it. And we're here for you. We're here for us, but we're here for you. New York Rangers, they 2.7 total heading into Boston. The Bruins have a 3.2. Not a lot of ownership in this game. It is quick in net for the Rangers. That kind of bumps up Pasternak for me, but you don't really need to bump him anyway. It's just like I play him against a brick wall. That line has 3.2% projected ownership. The only uh, line that's projected for over 0.7% in this game. I, I guess you can full stack them. I don't think I prioritize them by any stretch on this slate. But like a Pasternak one-off is always in play for me. Uh, especially if you're going like a mid-range build and you need a expensive one-off. It would probably be him on this slate or McDavid. There's no Matthews. There's no Colorado. There's no Minnesota, thankfully. So uh, Pasternak one off, definitely in play. You want a full stack Boston one and a min rage uh, build? I think that's fine. You know, seventeen nine is not um, too price prohibitive. And as you mentioned on the last show, the Rangers expect the goals against numbers just aren't great. Igor has been saving their tails recently. Quick is a pretty big downgrade, despite how good Quick has played this season. So I am in on Pasternak and Boston one. That's really about it. Uh, you want to play Boston two? Like there's other lines in that 16 K price range that I'd rather play. There's on, there's honestly lines in the 17, nine price range. I'd rather play like Vancouver at the end. There's a couple others that we'll get to, but like, I don't mind 3% Pasternak on this slate when it's, when it's quick on the Rangers side. If you get to some Rangers second line, in MME, I think they're under 20K for the first time in a while. They've actually been pretty good. They almost have the same top two percentage as Boston one. If they happen to get into your MME stuff, that's fine, but I'm not prioritizing the Rangers here. Yeah. Uh, I wish we knew what the matchups were probably going to be because I've been looking at, at matchups for the Rangers on the road recently, and teams honestly don't seem to be set on whether they're going to use their shutdown lines against is the manager I cried or Rosovic or Panarin Trocek Lafreniere? Like it honestly, it seems like it depends from team to team. I would be, I'd be, that's an important matchup specifically because like Jack Rosovic is doing exactly what we thought Jack Rosovic would do with the Rangers top line. And that's, he has made them better offensively. Um, they're at four, I think it's 4.7 goals per 60 since he got there. Obviously not a big sample yet, but um, they have been scoring uh, with Rosovic on the top line but also not great defensively 3.2 expected goals against for 60. Like that's, it's about what we expected. And that would, would be a good matchup for whomever uh, Boston sends out against them. We just don't know um, exactly what that's going to be. Now um, our buddy line matching uh, on Twitter, uh, whose uh, stuff that we use, it's outside uh, of what Stochastic has here. He has the coiled to brass Marchand line going out as a, against the badge at Kreider and Rossovic. That's, that's kind of interesting. Like, you know, there's no ownership on um, on that Marchand line. 
you get two out of the th like 0.7 percent you get two out of the three guys on the top power play unit like the rangers penalty kill has been very good um boston power play has not but you still get two out of the three guys on the top power play could be a decent matchup i think i'm kind of with you it's it's kind of like the boston game the other night where i'd be more interested in just one-offing some guys like you know obviously one off Pasternak is clearly uh, always in play um same thing on the ranger side like if you want to one-off like uh, panarin i think that's fine if you want to one-off uh you know even uh Kreider, even though i think he's getting a little bit expensive i think that's fine but like full stacking i just don't know because there are just other lines in that price range that i would rather play like uh, you know it's just the first game we'll get to them but we'll talk about winnipeg later we'll talk about vancouver later we'll talk about um you know vegas later we'll talk about yeah maybe even new jersey like there are just other spots that i would rather go to uh so i think for me i kind of agree with you like in single entry yeah i mean eh, yeah i'm not talking myself into rangers that would be the most homer thing i've done in a while philadelphia flyers with a 2.5 total Heading into Carolina, the Hurricanes have a 3.6 total. Another game where there's not a ton of ownership here. It's interesting because Carolina at home, well, first of all, Torts is scratching Sean Couturier again. Like, I wouldn't pat, put it past Torts completely to healthy scratch his captain for more than one game in a row. But at the same time, like, Couturier is coming off major back surgery. So, like... I feel like even if he's trying to send him a message, he's trying to get him some rest. With we both have had back surgery, back surgery. You probably need back surgery. There's just days you wake up, you feel awful. So, I don't know. I'm not defending torts anymore. How's my internet doing? Really sure. bad. But I I do like Carolina here a lot. What? Terrible, right? <laughs> Yeah, 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 it seems like you're about Just, five seconds behind. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, because my internet is just way behind right now. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of interest in the flyer side, like, especially where Carolina's goaltending is really stabilized basically since Christmas. Um, I, I just don't have interest in the flyers. You don't know if the lines are going to stay together. It's a brutal matchup for the top line going up against Stahl. You know, if you don't never stack the flyers for the penalty kill or for the power play, but Carolina's penalty kill still remains elite. Um, you know, if you're playing 150 lineups or whatever, and you're running three, two, one um, combinations, like maybe if you want a one off connect near or, or, or tip it or something like that, that's fine. But I, I'm not, I have no interest in stacking a single entry on the Carolina side. Like there is no ownership on them. Um, the top line is perfectly correlated, coming in at 1.1%. The second line coming in with a little bit of negative leverage, but it's honestly not that bad. And I wrote up the Carolina second line uh, in the picks article today, uh, free to read, up on stochastic.com. Uh, just head on over to the NHL section. Natchez and Sveshnikov, 110 minutes together with any center but Sebastian Ajo, 41 shots, 3.4 expected goals per 60 minutes at five on five. The Flyers. Still have three injuries on the blue line. Obviously, they traded Sean Walker. Um, Sam Erson or Felix Sandstrom, like Erson's starting tonight, but it hasn't really mattered. The cold tending's just been atrocious. Honestly, since Christmas, like it's been about three months of this, at least two and a half months of this, of just really bad goaltending from the Flyers. Um, the defense isn't like complete lockdown as it was in the first three or four months of the season. And when you combine a defense that's still good, but not elite, with goaltending that's been very bad. Um, I have a lot of interest in the Carolina side now. I have more interest in Carolina, too, here tonight. Be one, because they are spreading out the ice time. I know Carolina, one, has been absolutely nuts uh, since they got put together. I think Gensel has, what, like eight points in his, in, four, in his last four games or whatever. But they're still not getting that much ice time, and it's not a great power play matchup. So I'm not as worried about the lack of power play correlation um, I don't want to spend 20,400 for a, on DraftKings for a line that might only play 17 minutes here tonight. Like I'd rather spend under 15 K for a line that will probably play 16 minutes here tonight. That's just kind of the way that I look at it. 
Um, so Sveshnikov, Natchez, Kuznetsov is where I'm looking. Like I said, uh, ownership's in check. Uh, Natchez is like 17 shots in his last five games. So even after that huge shooting binge he went on a month ago, like he still kept up his shot rate reasonably well. Uh, Kuznetsov is you mentioned on the last show he's looked good since he got he got to carolina at the very least they're they're able to hide his defensive issues a little bit um i, I like carolina too i think both the carolina top lines are in play here tonight and i have no interest in the flyer side yeah i was gonna say like i like theoretically i like carolina one but like jake gensel as we said on the other show he's still priced like he's next to crosby this line was like 19 one or something like that i'd have much more interest in them but at 20,400 getting that those minutes like why wouldn't I just go play Edmonton at that point or go play Tampa at that point you know what I mean you know those guys are going to get their minutes above 20 the exception of Duclair but like you know these guys are going to play 17 minutes and not the best power play spot why might as well just move down the lineup and I agree Carolina 2 is my favorite line in this game you don't need too much from Kuznetsov at his price and Svechnikov and Natchez are the shooters anyway so they're gonna they're gonna get middle six matchups of the Flyers, which have been pretty bad. So yeah, Carolina too. New York Islanders with a 3.2 total heading into Detroit. The Red Wings still have or the also have a 3.2. Larkin could be back tonight. Larkin might not be back. They have to run tests. I don't know what kind of tests you need to figure out if he could play. I don't know. But as it is. If he's out, Austin Cesarnik was with Debrinkat and Kane for the second half of the game last time. That's kind of uh, crazy. Uh, Lucas Raymond, Confer Perron, 13-3. Like, I don't have a ton of interest in Detroit if Larkin's out. If Larkin's in, it kind of really boosts their power play, and this is a pretty good power play spot. It's not the best five-on-five five spot. Like, the Islanders have been pretty good defensively. So, with, it, with Larkin out, I don't have a ton of interest. Like, a one-off Kane is fine. One-off to bring Cat, fine, obviously. One-off Raymond has treated us well recently. If Larkin's in, and it's Larkin, Kane, to bring Cat, it's probably going to be close to 20,000. Might be a little bit over 20,000, something like that. I don't know, but... That's a line that I would consider just because it is a pretty good power play spot. You probably see Horvat, Nelson, Paul, Mary. It's okay. Five on five, you know what I mean? So, like, I would consider them with Larkin. But without Larkin, I'll just stick to one-offs. On the Islander side, you know, the Islander's top line fully correlated at 17-7 with Paul, Mary up there getting a little bit of positive leverage. I, I like them as another line in that 17K range. There's there's a handful that I do like. This is a good power play spot. There's nothing defensively that worries me on the wing side. So I, I do like the Islanders' top line in this game. Islanders' second line doesn't interest me too much. If you want a one-off Barzell, I think that's fine. But it, it would be New York Islanders' one is my favorite line in this game. If Larkin is back, I would definitely consider Detroit one. Yeah, I... I think there is merit to playing Detroit depending on Larkin being back and what the lineup looks like, because we have seen some weird lineup combinations uh, in Detroit, even with Larkin in the lineup, like, you know, like Perron, we've seen a, like a Larkin Perron uh, Kane line, which, you know, could be fine or, you know, the brain cat Perron Larkin, like something like that. They could be fine. But, but I just, I like, I don't have a lot of interest in Detroit. The One of the reasons why I would play the Wings, the only interest I have in Detroit is if Larkin is in. Because if Larkin is in, whatever the line combinations are, are probably going to be low owned, right? Because we won't know until warm-ups whether or not he's playing. And at that point, you can probably get yourself, you know, if Larkin's like 3 or 4% or something like that, his actual line combination is going to be a fraction of that. So, if you're playing 20 max, 150 max, you know, those types of things, you'll def if Larkin is in, you'll definitely want to recrunch um and put, you know, some Detroit in just because you'll be able to get Larkin's line at such a low combination, uh, low ownership combination. Other than that, I don't have any interest in the wings. For me, this is about the Islanders. And I will say, I'm interested in the Islanders whether Larkin's in or not. Like he's he's not a like he's not a trash fire defensively or anything. He's fine, but he is not like 
um, like a Patrice, Ber like Patrice Bergeron was, or an Alexander Barkov. Like he is not one of those two way types of centers. Um, he's a guy that can really help them a lot offensively. He's a guy that, that is fine defensively, but he's like, I, I think JT Confer might actually be the better defensive center. It's just that Larkin is way better offensively. Um, so whether Larkin's in or not, I have interest in the Island Islanders and Horvat, um, you know, Palmieri and, and Bo Horvat have actually been scoring in their minutes together. Like they're up to 60 minutes without Barzal. They're getting outplayed, but they're also scoring over three goals per 60 minutes uh, at five on five. And as you said, they're perfectly correlated on the power play. The Islanders power play has generally been very good this year. And, they've been drawing a lot more power plays since Patrick Watt took over. Like that was a big problem with the Islanders in the first like 40 games of the season, first half of the season was they had a really good power play, but they were getting like two and a half power play opportunities per game. And, you know, it's tough to bank on a good power play when they might only see the ice two or three times in a game. Since the all-star break, the Islanders have been at, are at 3.4, um, minor penalties drawn per game which isn't high but it is around the league average and considering that they were like bottom five bottom six in the league for like the first 40 games that is a big difference so they should see a little bit more power play time you know detroit does take their fair share of penalties they're above average in that respect um that islanders top line is perfectly correlated the one issue that i have is they have been seeing less minutes like you know, a few weeks ago, these guys were seeing like 20, 21, 22, 23 minutes a game. They've been under 20 often lately, but I think that's also, you see that reflected in the price, 17,700, including Paul Mary. That's not that bad. So I do have interest in Islanders one right now. I might have interest in Detroit, depending on what, Lark if Larkin is back and what the lineup, lineup looks like. But for now, it's Islanders one or nothing else. Yeah. Winnipeg Jets, a 3.1 total. Heading into New Jersey, the Devils have a 2.9. It is not Connor Hellebuck tonight. It is Laurent Brossois. I would hope that Jake Allen is starting for the Devils again tonight. Uh, but I didn't see anything. I probably missed it. But as it is, Heesher, Brat, Meyer, Hughes, Hall, Holtz from last game. I didn't see lines this morning either. Um, but they had, I think back. they had practice yesterday and as another one of those, um, Jack Hughes didn't practice, but it looks like he should play tonight. So I would expect yeah. the same top six. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alan confirmed. Thank you, Clayton. At least the devils do something right to start their best goalie. This is an interesting game because the, the ownership's on the devil side here, but it's, I think it's the Winnipeg side that I like better. And like I know I have I trashed I follow on Tuesday <laughs> and he doesn't do much for me but I, it is that top line for Winnipeg that I, I do like they're, they're another one of those lines in the 17k range 17 one coming with 0.7 percent ownership Connor and Shifley top power play they have very very good numbers together with I follow they're kind of pedestrian but they're both on the top power play they're gonna get he sure Brat Meyer and like that line's pretty high event and i know jake allen had a very good game the other night but like the devil's blue line not very good jake allen is slightly off that that line can fill the net and i'm and i know people are going to be saying hey you know josh you know monahan ehlers to fully look great yeah there's 700 dollars less for 12 minutes ehlers and to fully played 12 minutes monahan played 14 like this that's this is a bonus special. You know what I mean? Like uh, I don't want to pay sixteen four. Oh, by by the way, um, you keep doing this with Rick Bonus, but he's not with the team right now uh, due to taking care of a personal medical issue. So he had, he had surgery. Second time this like, season you've done that. I wish you the best, Rick. But your coaching drives me nuts. <laughs> um, yeah. The, whoever the associate head coach, I don't even know, is going to play him 12, 13 minutes. And I don't want to do that. So I'm going to go to the top line here. Connor and Shifley, you want to play I follow, you don't. You want to add in someone for the top power play. I would prefer it to be Morrissey, but you could do to Foley or Monahan. Like Monahan is okay because he at least gets 15, 16 minutes. 
um, Scott Arneal, oh, Rangers legend Scott Ar- Arneal. But um, yeah, it is Winnipeg one. That Heisher Brat Meyer line is pretty high event. Their blue line sucks. Their goaltenders, you know, Jake Allen's easily their best goaltender this season, which isn't really saying much. He's struggled in, in Montreal, so would be Winnipeg one for me. On the Devil side, like I don't know. The top line, I think it would also be that top line, just because like with I follow there, this they're not that great. And it's not Hellebuck, but like I don't know. I don't feel great stacking a team on an eleven game slate um against the jets they are very good defensively so if anything it would be that top line i know holtz actually stayed there the whole game i just it would be the winnipeg top line for me uh yeah like don't get me wrong i'm a big alex holtz guy he also played what 13 minutes in that game Gordon like, Tripoli. it's a good point it's actually a really good point um, you know, and him and Hughes actually do have good expected goals numbers together this season, 3.3 expected goals per 60, um, in about 85 minutes together. Like that's pretty good. I still don't think Hughes is healthy. Like that's just part of it. Right. And you know, if you have a Hughes that's at like 75% because of a bad shoulder and Eric Hall is Eric Hall, and then you have Alex Holtz, who's, you know, probably uh, one cough in the wrong, wrong direction away from just being sent to the dressing room for the rest of the game. Um, uh, yeah, this is New Jersey one um, or bust for me. 18,800, I think is fine. It is a brutal matchup, right? Like Winnipeg's still really good defensively. We don't have confirmation on on Connor Hellebuck starting. Now, Winnipeg doesn't have a back-to-back or anything. Um, it, it Feels weird that Brosois would get a start, but, uh, you know, maybe that happens. But the New Jersey top line, Hisher, Brat, and Meyer, I was looking at their numbers since defense, since December 1st because I wanted to see how they did without how they've been doing um, without Dougie Hamilton in the lineup. 4.4 expected goals per 60, 4.2 actual goals per 60. Like, whether it's been Meyer or whether it's been Palat, that Hisher, Brat duo has just been dynamic offensively for months now. Like under four percent, like I think that's perfectly fine, uh, especially where they're perfectly correlated on the top power play. Power play generally hasn't been great. Winnipeg doesn't take a lot of penalties, but the Winnipeg penalty kill has struggled at times this season. And even when they're good, they're about average. Like it's it is something that New Jersey can kind of exploit. I think I would prefer New Jersey one over Winnipeg here. Like Winnipeg, it feels a little bit like chasing points and. You know, the Winnipeg top line with I follow there, they've been fine, but not great. 2.7 expected goals, three actual goals per 60 at 5 on 5. Like, that's fine, but that's not like a lead or anything. The reason why you might play them is because they're only 17,100. Like, they're not that expensive. Um, it's a pretty reasonable price. It's not a bad matchup. I will say the New Jersey penalty kill has actually been good. It's honestly been good for most of the year, like goaltending notwithstanding. So um, that's something that kind of hurts Winnipeg here. I think I prefer New Jersey over the Winnipeg side, especially where, as you mentioned, like Winnipeg 2, Winnipeg 2 is like that that Tyler Toffoli, Nick Ehler, Sean Monahan line is the third line. Um, Winnipeg absolutely loves the Adam Lowry line. They use them a lot. Um, They're going to get their ice time. That's what kind of sucks. Like, I think Winnipeg one is fine to play. I just think given how well Hisher and Brad have played almost regardless of the third winger next to them for months now, um, I do like new and they're perfectly correlated. I do like New Jersey one over Winnipeg one, but it's for me, it's both top lines or nothing else. Yeah. If the Monaghan line, they got consistent 15, 16 minutes, I'd have a lot more interest in them but 12 13 minutes with power play time is just an absolute circus sign up using the link in the chat to get access to the best nhl data and tools in the industry you get player and ownership projections top stacks tools line combinations and access to the premium discord which is probably the most important thing in the history of dfs because you get daily deposit frostbacks goalies and he hasn't picked a goalie with a positive score since the Vietnam War ended. So you got to get in there. You say, hey, who are you playing? And then you just stack against. We have long evidence. We have lots of proof 
even the last night we had two guys ship against Frostback's goalie. He's becoming sort of a legend. But yeah, you get in that Discord. I, I don't even know if anything I say matters. You just got to ask him what his goalie is and you just stack against. It, it might be the new meta. He can take it. He's he's got a he's he's got a you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, the frostback goalie tool presented by Stochastic. <laughs> like yeah. he just it's just one thing on the page and it's just the name of the goalie he's playing that night. <laughs> it's he always sends like a gif, right? And it's always horrifying to try to figure it out because I'm awful at trying to figure that stuff out. I'm like, please don't let me have the same goalie. I'm gonna have to redo my whole lineup. But yeah, no, he, he's got a good sense of humor. He can take it. But yeah, if you're interested in going premium for the last month of the season, hop in the Discord, go through the link, and uh, we'll go from there. St. Louis Blues with a 3.1 total. Heading into Ottawa, the Senators have a 3.3. We have our first This Game Sucks of the Night. This game absolutely sucks. Brady Kachuk, Shane Pinto, Drake Batherson, 18-9, 14.8% top two stack, 12% projected ownership. One of the highest projected ownerships on the night. They don't even have a positive goal share. That's the line. The issue is the Blues top line of Thomas, Shen, and Neighbors, they have a pretty good sample. They're absolutely fucking atrocious defensively. 21 high danger chances against per 60. 3.2 expected goals against per 60. Drew is a game time decision there, Marco. Um Like, I get wanting to play Ottawa 1 here, and they have a 3.3 total. Just like it's an ownership thing. Like, it feels like bad chalk when uh, – Chesty, that's actually that's actually pretty good. But Kachuk, Pinto, Batherson, they control the play only 48%. But this Blues line is so bad that, like, I don't know. Like, I'm very conflicted here. The price is pretty good, too. Um, it's not the best power play spot because the Blues don't take a ton of penalties. I'm leaning towards fanning them just because, like, this Ottawa team sucks so bad. Like, if Giroux's in, I maybe would have interest in Stutzla Giroux. I don't know, man. Like, and these Blues lines on the Blues side, like, I don't want to play 13-3 Thomas Shen neighbors at 8.5%. I'd, I'd have more interest in Buchnevich, Kairou, but if Giroux's in, they're probably going to see a fair bit of the Stutzla Giroux line, and they've been pretty good. Th there's a reason why I stamped this. This game sucks because this game sucks, and I don't want to play anything in this game. But like, you have to kind of consider both sides. I'm like, I'm going to be honest. I do have interest in the St. Louis side, and like, yes, there is a lot of ownership. There, there is negative leverage coming in on them. Um, as you mentioned, top line, eight and a half percent ownership, 2.6 percent top two stack percentage. A couple of the reasons. One, <laughs> I, I'm getting tired of I mean, now that Josh Norris is injured, my new whipping boy is Jake Batherson. I'm getting <laughs> real sick of seeing Jake Batherson on the top line with Brady Kachuk. Um, with Batherson on the top line with Kachuk, 2.6 expected goals. Without Batherson, it's 3.7. With Batherson on the top line, 2.8 actual goals per 60. Without Batherson, 3.8 goals per 60. Like, Send Grieg up there. Send Grieg up there. I would love to see it. The problem is, is like Grieg's a left shot. I don't think Jacques Martin's updated his coaching style in 30 years, so I don't think he's going to be a big fan of playing a guy on his off wing on the top line. That's just kind of what it is. So we're stuck with Drake Batherson and like he does not he like he just doesn't help the top line. Um there's nothing there that I I, I really have interest in. The second line, like if Giroux's in, then fine. Cause you know, Stutzel still gets ice time. 17 points in his last 17 games. They're at 2.8 expected goals, 2.8 actual goals. Like their offensive numbers, the Giroux Joseph Stutzel line are now better than the top lines with Batherson because Batherson is dragging everything down. So where St. Louis doesn't take a ton of penalties and Ottawa's power play is just atrocious. Yeah, they suck. Um, it sucks. 
Um, I'm not super worried about correlation in this game, so I would probably play Ottawa too, but it's St. Louis one because neither of the top lines have really been that great defensively. Like even the Giroux line, their expected goals against are below average since the all-star break. Actual goals against because of the goaltending and because of their defensemen are way worse. Speaking of defensemen, Travis Hamannick, game time decision. Like if he's in, I would be a, a lot more interested in playing the blues because you want to talk about this guy sucks. This guy sucks. And I like I'm not a big fan of the St. Louis top line with Shen Babers and, and Thomas, but they're perfectly correlated on the power play. And the Ottawa penalty kill, which was like one thing that they could kind of hang on to this season as being decent, has not been decent for a while now. Um, bottom 10, bottom five by goals against per 60 since the um, all-star break, below average by shots against. I think it's like 21st. Or something like that. So the penalty kill is really falling apart. The St. Louis power play, we talked about it over and over and over with Jake Neighbors there. It has been night and day. He has been a big difference maker for them as a net front guy. Um, it really opens some extra passing lanes and shooting lanes for the team. It helps them a lot on the power play. That top line is perfectly correlated. Like I'm not running out to play St. Louis here tonight because there's a little bit of negative leverage. But honestly, man, a perfectly correlated top line that should all play like neighbors might only play like 17, 18. The other guys will probably be around 20 minutes around. So they'll all play around 18 to 20 minutes and perfectly correlated top line against this Ottawa Senators team coming in at under 10% ownership. Like, I, sorry, man. Like I do have interest in Thomas Shen neighbors here tonight. Yeah. I mean, like I get it. I'm just like at the point in the season, we just hit banana land where we're talking about, stacking this line at 13-3 with negative leverage against another bad team. Like, you got to give these teams, like, a reason to keep playing. Like, got to start sending these teams to, like, the ECHL if they're in the bottom of the standings. Relegation, man. Send the bottom two teams to the AHL and then have their owners lose tens of millions of dollars in revenue and then see how hard they try to lose games towards the end of the season from, from yeah, that, that like, point on. These bad matchups just drive me nuts because these teams are just like sneak tanking. Some some of them they don't even hide it. It is very bad. Nashville Predators with a 2.7 total heading into Florida. The Panthers have a 3.4. Barkov is a game time decision. We kind of speculating that he will play. Lines would be Reinhardt, Barkov for Hagee, Bennett, Kachuk, Erod, Tank down on the third line. Uh, anytime Nashville's on the slate, I hear 960 save percentage behind Nashville 1. 960 oh, percentage. Yeah, and, and it's Kevin Lankinen getting the start. It's not Saros. Yep. yep, it's Lankinen. If there's ever a game for that 960 save percentage to regress, it is with Florida 1. If Barkov is in, I have interest in that line. Uh, with Verhage there, they'll Definitely be over 20,000 and one of the more expensive lines on the night. Uh, you, you made it. You just missed getting absolutely roasted for about 38 seconds in the segment before. You're going to have to go back and watch it. Uh, just let us know who you're playing in net, and we can just end the show. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just tell, you, tell the whole chat just to stack against your goalie, and we can just go offline. But no, I'm just kidding. Um <laughs> With Verhage there, they'll probably be one of the more expensive lines on the night. Um, but I, I, I have interest. They're fully correlated. Nashville's penalty kill is not great. Lankinen's a huge step down from Saros. I like Lankinen. It's just the truth. Nashville one has a ridiculous save percentage behind them. Their defensive numbers have been sliding for a while now. I, I really like Florida one here. You want to play Florida two? Sure. That's fine. But I prefer Florida one here. On the Nashville side, this is just a brutal matchup for Nashville. Um, I don't know, man. Like 20,100 for Nashville, one on the road in Florida with a 2.7 total. Like that just does not interest me. Like you want to play like Zucker and Sissons. They actually have ridiculously good numbers together. Like sure. Sure. Like if you want to fit in some power play stuff, that's fine. But like I'm not running out to play Nashville here. Yeah, this is not a great matchup for Nashville. The nice thing about Sissons, like you're right about Sissons and Zucker, 
50 minutes together, 74 shot attempts, 4.6 expected goals per 60. Zucker has 15 shots in five games. <laughs> Maybe I was too harsh on you the other day when I mean better in that system than he did ever did in Arizona. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, second and third line matchups, we talk about how the Bennett Kachuk line has not been elite defensively or anything this year. The third line, especially with Tarasenko that are there now is not going to be great defensively. I, I see the, the, the reasoning for playing them because they're cheap enough to stack with, you know, Edmonton or Tampa Bay or, or anything like that. But um, this is a Florida game for me, especially with Lankin and starting and like no shots at Lankin. And he's actually like, he's a, he's a good backup goalie. Um, but he's not UC Saros. And you're right about Reinhardt Barkov with Verhage there. Uh, the top line would be the second most expensive line on the slate. I think it's 21,400 off the top of my head. Um, yeah, but uh, two grand behind Edmonton, just ahead of Tampa Bay, only $1,000 more expensive than Carolina. So it's not like they're like way out of line or anything like that. The top line with Verhage, three and a half expected goals, 3.2 actual goals per 60 minutes. I was doing some research on Verhage yesterday. And he's actually improved his playmaking numbers like a lot over the last two and a half months, like two, two and a half months to the point where he's actually been a pretty good, not a pretty good, a decent assist guy because this has actually not been a great five on five scoring team. That's the one thing that kind of worries me here is that Florida's five on five scoring has not been that great. They've really lived on the power play. Now they do draw a lot of power play opportunities, but Nashville's penalty kill has generally been very good. Um, the only time they got, they've been got, getting into trouble is when the goaltending's kind of let them down, but that Florida one line is not coming in with much ownership at all. Um, two and a half percent. Now that's with Tarasenko there. I imagine it might even go down, um, with Verhege there. Cause there is like what? $3,000 more or $2,500 more expensive. So I do like Florida one here. There's a line I like best by far in this game. I'm interested to see how Erod does on the second line because he's not a great finisher. Like he's a guy that will shoot about seven percent over the full, over a full season. And Sam Bennett's actually kind of the same way. <laughs> so like, yeah, it puts a lot of on Kachuk's shoulders uh, for scoring. But it's four to one. I like in this game. I guess if you want to play the season's lines from from Nashville, it's fine. Um, but I, I much prefer the Florida side here. Agreed. Buffalo Sabres with a 2.5 total heading into Edmonton. The Oilers have a 3.5. Edmonton going with McDavid, Hyman, Kane, Dreisaitl, Fogel, McLeod, Nugent Hopkins, Henrik, Derek, Ryan. Buffalo mixing up their top line, putting J.J. Paterka with Thompson and Tuck for uh, – I've been waiting for that since November. Um, who, t- who takes Paterka's spot? On the second line? Benson. It's Benson, Greenway, and Cousins. Benson, Greenway, and Cousins. Okay. Then Skinner is with Krebs. Like, I don't know if this is the best matchup to go play Buffalo here. (laughs) Edmonton is just good defensively. They got a good penalty kill. I mean, like, I don't know, man. With Kane on the top, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly talking myself into Buffalo here. With Kane on the top line... Not great defensively. That second line, not great defensively. I don't know. Maybe I'll take a a, a, a stab a Rooney on Thompson, Tuck, Paterka. Like I don't really want to play Edmonton either. I think a McDavid one off, obviously fine. But like, I don't know. With Paterka up on that top line, maybe that top line gets worse defensively. Like Gergensen's is pretty good defensively. Paterka probably not. So, like, that's a reason to play Edmonton one, but they are 23-6 with Kane, and they're not correlated on the power play, and it's a pretty good power play spot, which is the issue. So, like, if you have to add in, like, Dreisaitl or Nugent Hopkins, it's still going to be around the same price, and then you're going across lines. So, like, I think, like, obviously McDavid one off at that ownership, perfectly fine. A one-off Dreisaitl at his ownership, fine. I just don't know on this slate, when there's like, I think Tampa's in a, in a much better spot. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm going to full stack anything from Edmonton here. Yeah. I think the case for Buffalo one is doing the math in my head is that line is under 16 K. 
Um, you know what I mean? Like that's, it's a pretty cheap top line. And uh, if you look at other lines, like in that price range, like you're talking about like Seattle second line, Detroit with Austin Zarnick, um, they're cheaper than some of the Anaheim lines. <laughs> like that's kind of the point. It is not a great matchup, even with Evander Kane on the top line, like McDavid and Kane, like McDavid's actually had really good defensive numbers, almost regardless of who he's played with this season, which is um, one, I think one of the reasons why they've had such good defensive numbers as a team is because him and, well, not Dreisaitl so much, he's still not good defensively, but uh, Connor McDavid anyways has been really good uh, at both ends of the ice. So I don't have any, I don't have a problem playing Buffalo one, particularly. I think Paterka, um, after Skinner is probably their best offensive winger at this point. All due respect to, uh, to Alex Tuck, I think he's. I think of him as more of a two-way winger um, right now. But I think I prefer. I would prefer to play the Edmonton side here and like the Edmonton top line, twenty-three thousand six hundred. I, I kind of agree with you. Like where it's not perfectly correlated, even though Buffalo's penalty kill has generally been good, where it's not perfectly correlated, it kind of takes me out. Um, that's one of the reasons why you really do uh, play Edmonton is because they are perfectly correlated because the top line, almost regardless of what they put together, has been perfectly correlated on the power play. You know, Edmonton's still not drawing very many power play opportunities. Buffalo not giving up a lot. Now, Buffalo's penalty kills has not been that great. Go peck a and in halves. Um, kind of agree with you here. I wrote up Evander Kane in the picks article because him and David just have been good offensively together. 3.9 goals uh, per 60 so far this season. Um, and Kane's shot at, shot attempts are up 20% when he has McDavid as opposed to when he has like Dreisaitl or RNH or anything like that as a center. So I do think like Kane makes a fine one-off. Um, obviously McDavid is always a fine one-off. Like if you want to dip down to the second line, I think that's fine. I kind of agree with you. Like it, it feels scary to say. I, I don't think there's going to be a ton of goals in this game. That's what I'm kind of worried about. So, like, Buffalo won. They're fine. Edmonton won. They're fine. I think I'm just more inclined to be playing some of the cheaper wing, uh, winger one-offs than I would be to stack whole lines. Yeah. Agreed. Chicago Blackhawks with a 2.9 total heading into Anaheim. Los Patos have a 3.1 total. This game was in Chicago not too long ago, and Chicago's top line went absolutely nuclear on the power play at 5-on-5 five five in the rafters in Section 107. This is a little bit different in Anaheim. Uh, Anaheim also getting a little bit healthier. They'll have Carlson and Terry this time, which is going to make a difference. You were mentioning before the show that at home – um, Anaheim sends out the Lundestrom, Silverberg, Max Jones line against top competition. And you look at the sample on the season, their defensive numbers have been excellent. So I don't have a ton of interest in the Bedard, Kershev, Johnson line. They are fully correlated. The Ducks still have a bad penalty kill. So if you want to do it, I understand. Just know that it is not a good five on five matchup. The, actually, the highest line in this game is Felino, Anthony C. Reichel, which is absolutely bananas. Like, I kind of wanted a one off of Anthony C. U. here tonight, but at 8%, I'd rather just throw myself down a flight of metal stairs. Like, I'll go find someone else. This is a Ducks game for me, as painful as it is. And you were mentioning, and I'll let you hit on it as well, they've been sending. Out, they've been trying to get Carlson Terry Kalorn out against bottom six of the opposition, which would for them avoid the Dickinson Joe Anderson line, which is very important. I do have interest in Terry Carlson Kalorn at 14 6. It's not the best power play matchup, but it will be a good five on five matchup. So I am interested in the Terry Carlson Kalorn line. If you want to play Chicago one, go for it. Um, again, not a good five on five matchup, still a good power play matchup. I and mean, I would imagine the Vitrano McTavish Strom line is going to see a fair bit of that Dickinson line. So it, it would be a Terry Carlson corner bust for me. Yeah, I 
I do have a little interest in the Chicago top line just because they are perfectly correlated, right? And that Anaheim penalty kill is just, it's a mess. And, you know, not only do they take a ton of penalties, um, they're, what, four and a half? Uh, no, five, sorry, times um, minor penalties taken per game. Sorry, not time shorthanded. Minor, five minor penalties taken per game since the All-Star break. They are wildly undisciplined. It's That's just been the case all season. Um, just kind of pointing out it's been the case over the last six weeks as well, six, seven weeks. Um, Chicago's not drawing a ton of power play opportunities, but they're right under the league average, so at least they're getting some power play time. The Chicago top power play unit has actually been, like, dare I say, good. <laughs> so far uh, with Nick with Nick Felino there um you know I, I wrote up Seth Jones in the picks article we'll talk about defenseman later I like Seth Jones tonight but they're per, they're perfectly correlated on the top sorry go ahead they uh Chicago just had lines and morning skate it's now Felino Bedard Kurashev Anthony CU Tyler Johnson Reichel then Slagger Dickinson Anderson and the fourth line doesn't matter so it's yeah Felino and- yeah Felino and Johnson flop I mean Six of one, half a dozen of the other, like that doesn't really change a whole lot for me because um, they're That's all still on the power. Game. Yeah. Um, so I think it is a decent power play matchup, and they're coming in with positive leverage, like 4.6% ownership, 5.3% top two stack percentage. Like Chicago just put up seven goals on the Ducks a week ago or like 10 days ago or whatever it was, right? So we know that they can blow this team out of the water, uh, especially if they can double down with a power play or something. I don't mind Chicago one here. The line I do like best in this game is Terry Carlson Kalorn. And the reason I do like them, and I wrote up Troy Terry in the article, but the reason I do like them is because unlike most lines of this game, they're actually good. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, 2.7 expected goals for 2.2 expected goals against 210 minutes together. Like getting a Ducks line with positive expected goals numbers in a 200 minute sample on this Ducks team is miraculous. And Terry has a really, really good projection. Um, what I noted in the article, he's the highest projected winger uh, that Stochastic has for under 6K on DraftKings or under 7K on FanDuel. So there is a pretty strong projection here. They are going to get bottom six matchups. They have played well this season. Now they're split on the power play, but Chicago doesn't take a lot of penalties, and the power penalty kill has generally been fine to good this season. So it is more about the five-on-five five matchups, and they get great ones. And, yeah, coming in with a little bit of negative leverage, um, but, you know, 5.9% against 3.3% top two stack is just fine, especially at 14,600, like, it's kind of they're not quite a filler but they're also cheap enough where unless you're stacking them with like edmonton or florida or something you can still put like a pretty good uh you know uh focal point stack around them and still get good defensemen in your lineup and not be punting everything so i do like the terry carlson Kalorn line here um i also like the bedard line so it's both top what we have is both top lines uh, for me in this game yeah, and it's also Arvid Soderblom in net for Chicago, not Morazic. Soderblom, 4.02 goals against average, negative or minus 17.1 goal save above expected this season. <laughs> not a great season from Soderblom, who we liked last year. Um, we have a super chat before we continue here, 1999 from Gabagool. I, I want some Gabagool for lunch, but I can't sad but thank you for the super chat had a big night on tuesday very close to my best sports betting night ever thanks for all the work boys hey uh we don't make your sports bets just like we don't make your lineup so you're obviously retaining some good information that i wish i could retain better (laughs) but um congrats to you and uh thank you for the super chat yeah thanks a lot for the super chat we certainly do appreciate those (coughs) i don't do much sports betting but um always happy to hear that whatever we you know hopefully some things we say or some things we talk about can help people uh win a little bit of money and you know one of your best sports betting nights i hope that you know we could play a small part in that so thanks a lot for the super chat um hopefully you can have another one here tonight uh, another big night yeah and uh before we get on to the next game just wanted to say thank you guys again for the support with the affiliate signups and i will 
as always, there is MMA this weekend. It is another Apex card. It's one that I happen to like. A lot of underdogs live here. I will have a my quick picks video out either tonight or tomorrow uh, before noon, like last week. Depends how the old nurse is feeling. She's had the flu. If she needs some help, I will help. And it will be out on Friday. What a family, man. You know what I mean? Just what a guy. Montreal Canadiens with a 2.3 total heading into Vancouver. The Canucks have a 3.7. Not too much ownership here on the Canucks. I thought there would be more. This is the second highest total on the night. This is one of the better power play spots on the night. And the JT Miller Brock Besser suitor line at 17 1 with 7% top two, 7.8% projected ownership. They're fully correlated. Pedersen, Garland, Hoglander, 14-9, 4% top two stack, 8.3% projected ownership. They'll be getting not Montreal one lines, which is, you know, doesn't really matter. Uh, it's going to be advantageous for the Pedersen line. But it is the JT Miller, Brock Besser, Suter line that I like the best. They're 17-1. It's a mid-range line, fully correlated in an excellent power play spot. And they've been very good on the power play. And, you know, the Suzuki, Caulfield, Slavkowski line has been very good offensively, but it's not like they're anything to fear defensively either. So I'm very much in on this Vancouver second line. You want to go to Vancouver one? I think that's perfectly fine. But in a power play spot that is so good, I want as many guys on the power play as possible. So I'm going to Vancouver two here. On the Montreal side, like it would be the Caulfield Suzuki Slavkovsky line, but like that Miller Besser line has been unbelievably good defensively. And I know it's Casey the Smith in that, but like you're not getting an ownership discount on them. Three and a half percent projected ownership, only 16 nine at that point. Just give me the extra $200 and go to Vancouver here. So it is Vancouver two for me. Vancouver one, I think is fine uh, as well. Yeah. Like, 16,900 is is a really generous price for the Habs. Like this was a line that was pushing 19k very recently. Um that price has been going down a lot on DraftKings, which is why they're kind of interesting, but it is a brutal matchup. Like that suitor that suitor Besser Miller line, like we've talked about it before, Probably the best line the Canucks have had this season, other than maybe when that Dakota Joshua, you know, Teddy Bluger line was really humming along. But that Miller line with Suter there is at 3.7 expected goals for 1.5 expected goals against in 160 minutes together. 5.7 actual goals for 1.2 actual goals against per 60. Like they have been completely dominant, whether you look at by expected goals, whether you look at shot attempts, whether you look at actual goals, they just dominated it's a really bad matchup for montreal one you look at other lines in that montreal price range like the new york islanders top line is only 800 dollars more expensive um you know you talk about vancouver like just pay a couple hundred bucks play the vancouver side instead uh, the winnipeg top line um couple only a couple hundred dollars more expensive this sh- it's like would you rather play montreal on the road against this Vancouver against that JT Miller line or would you rather play Bedard on the road in that Anaheim power play matchup you know what like that's kind of what I'm getting at so you know if you're playing 20 max 150 obviously you get Montreal a little bit more consideration I don't think in single entry I would do it I'm with you on Vancouver too I'm also in on just power play stacking the Canucks here you know putting Vancouver to adding Pedersen and even adding Hughes they're not overly expensive because Suter is so cheap so um you know it's seventeen thousand one hundred uh for the miller line you add in pedersen you're at 24 4 you add in hughes you're at thirty one thousand, and you still have 19k left for your goalies and your two and uh your defenseman and another like cheap stack or two-man stack or something like you can do it very very easily uh montreal's taking a lot of penalties four minor penalties uh taken per game uh, since the all-star break is the third most of any team on the slate Vancouver's power play with Suter there 14.7 goals per 60 66 shots per 60 minutes it's not a big sample yet but it certainly looked like the bank it's looking like the what the Vancouver power play was was doing in the first two months of the season so 
this is a Vancouver game for me. I love the Miller line. I also don't mind power play stacking here. Like it's such a good power play matchup that I, I, I'm trying to figure out ways to that I would want to stack Vancouver while including Elias Pettersson because um, leaving him out of stacks in a power play matchup this good like just kind of feels bad. But I like the Vancouver top six just in general a lot here tonight. Same. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have to include Quinn Hughes. I just wish his peripherals were better for his price, but like this is such a good power play spot that I think you can. Yeah, it just, it just feels like one Tampa of those Bay Lightning games. with a no. I was just gonna say it feels like one of those games where like he just gets like three assists and two shots, and all of a sudden he's he's got twenty one DK points for six sixty four hundred or whatever it is. You know what I yeah. mean? Like that's just kind of it. Yeah, for sure. Tampa Bay Lightning with a 4.2 total. Heading into San Jose, the Sharks have a 2.4. Anyone want some Duclair revenge narrative? Do you live on Narrative Street? Does anyone care that he used to play on the on the Sharks? Like, I don't even know if he remembers playing for the Sharks a few weeks ago. I don't know. But that line is 21-2. Highest top two stack percentage of the night at 23-1. 15% projected ownership. Fully correlated. What, do you, what can you say about Tampa 1 here? I love them. You want to play them, you play them. You don't, you don't. Um, interestingly enough, Stamkos, Hagel, Sorelli getting 14.1% projected ownership, and that does nothing for me. Like, I, that's, I, I'm fading that line. Like, you want to add Stamkos into a power play stack? Go ahead. But, like, I, like Stamkos into a power play stack, fine. I know you love Hagel. Like, Sorelli's a good player. That line just doesn't work. So I like for that ownership, I'm just going right to the top line. Top line or bust for me there. You want to go to uh Essamont Paul? Like anyone's in play for Tampa tonight. Like literally anybody. Like Luke Lynn Denning, the worst forward by a lot of metrics on the season. Don't play Luke Lynn Denning. But like you can play Paul Esmont, if you want a really cheap two man, or Shiri Paul, Shiri Esmont, something like that. If you need a really, really cheap two man, um, but Tampa one, Tampa power play easily. On the shark side, they are just like butchering the lines here. The only line that's staying together is Granlin, Zetterlin, Costin. They're coming in at five percent at twelve seven. I just like if they happen to get in your crunches, sure, but I'm not going out of my way to play any sharks tonight. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot of interest in San Jose here. Um, you know, over on 12, 000, like 12,700, I get if you want to play them as a filler because two out of three guys on the top power play, they have, they've been honestly fine offensively for the most part this season. Um, without Duclair since January 1st, that top line's at 2.8 expected goals, 3.3 actual goals per 60. So they've actually been fine. Uh so I, I get wanting to play them. And honestly, like when you look at filler stacks down in that price range, they're always going to be over leveraged. Like, you know, St. Louis uh, was over leveraged. Uh, the Islanders second line over leveraged. You know, Buffalo, Philly, Vegas, doesn't matter. They're all coming in with negative leverage. So it, it, that they're 4% or whatever, it's not a big deal. Uh, I don't have, like, if, I find it's weird that they're basically. <laughs> The top line got for San Jose got scored on four times last game, and they boot William Eklund off the second line to the fourth line. David it's Quinn, like, baby. Maybe you're looking at the wrong players here. <laughs> That's why I say I'm pretty sure that the San Jose coaching staff is sneak tanking um, the end of the season here to try to get their uh, draft lottery position improved. Either way, this is a Tampa game for me. Um, I wrote them up in the picks article. Duclair, three goals, five points, and 10 shots in four games with Tampa Bay. The team has scored 23 goals in those four games, and they were all playoff teams that they played. I think that's the thing that really stood out for me uh, in those Tampa wins. Not only did they win four in a row with Duclair in the lineup, but it was over Philly, over the Rangers, in Florida against the Panthers, and in Vegas against the Golden Knights. So, like, at home, on the road, against playoff teams, they've just been throttling. And... You know, Tampa Bay's top line, four and a half goals per 60 minutes with Point Kucherov on the ice since the All-Star break. They've just been absolutely torching everybody. Like, this is Tampa 1, especially where with Duclair there. Like, he got taken off the power play last game for Nick Paul. I don't even think that matters. 
like if you want to take out Duclair and put in Paul to try to get a little bit of extra power play correlation, I think it's fine. But at 21,200, I don't even care if they're 15%. It's just a really, really good matchup. Like this San Jose team is starting to look like the San Jose team from the first month of the season when they were losing like 10 to 1 every night. Um, I really like Tampa 1 here in this matchup. I, I'm with you if you want to go to Tampa 3 for a cheap two man stack or something like that because you're playing Edmonton or whatever, like go ahead. But for me, it's Tampa 1 in this game. Yeah, I, I went and looked at uh, the sample for Chicago 1 or San Jose 1 while you were talking. <laughs> They've actually, it's pretty funny because the defensive numbers in a really solid sample are good. It's like four high danger chances against 1.66 expected goals against, but 8.3 actual goals against. They got torched. I mean, it doesn't matter that the goaltending was bad. So, like, yeah, like they're just going to get run over. <sighs> Seattle Kraken 2.6 total heading into Vegas. The Golden Knights have a 3.3 total. Seattle's still going with these uh Eberle, Tolvin, and Beneers line, McCann, Bjorkstrand, Burkowski, Gord, Cartier, Yamamoto. I don't know what they're doing. They're I think Dave Hackstall is just bored and picking names out of a hat. Vegas going with Eichel Marcel Barbashev, Stevenson. Roy Mantha, Carlson, Amadio, Cotter. I don't know yeah, if you're a fan. I missed if you said it, but Jane, it looks like Jane Schwartz is back on the second one. Oh, yeah, on the second one. Yeah, yeah. For, for Bjork Shane, yeah. Yeah, I missed that. But, yeah, I saw it and I didn't register. But, like, I don't know. I, I do like Vegas 1 here. I, I call Marshall Barbashev at 18.5, 10% top 2, 6.8% projected ownership, positive leverage. But, like, I don't know if I would prefer them than like, I'd rather just save the 1400 and go play Vancouver. You know what I mean? Like maybe you can play them together, but like, I, I don't, I don't love Vegas. I think they're fine. You want to go to like, I, I don't want to play a, a Roy Stevenson Mantha line. Like I think Carlson Amadio is fine. If Dorfe is back in the lineup, maybe I'll have some interest there, but like, I don't love Vegas here. I don't love Seattle either. If anything, it would be Eberle, Tolvin, and Beniers. They've had a, they've had, they're pretty good offensive numbers in a small sample, and you know they'll probably there there isn't like a line on Vegas right now that scares me defensively. So I, like honestly, I think my favorite line in this game is Eberle, Tolvin, and Beniers. Like it is a small sample, and maybe it will flatten out, but like they have really really good numbers together. Here's the thing, man, is one of the reasons why we don't like playing Seattle is because they generally usually spread out ice time. Like the Fords all play between like 13 and 17 or 18 minutes and they have split power play correlation. Um, Seattle's top line of Tolman and Beneers Everly is perfectly correlated on the power play. And last game, I think they were all over 20 minutes and that's been a, or two out of the three were over 20 and then Tolman was at like 19 or something like that. That's been a more regular occurrence recently with these guys playing, getting a lot of ice time, and now they're perfectly correlated. It's something we almost never see from Seattle. And I agree with you. There's no defensive matchup on the Vegas side that particularly concerns me. Uh, you know, Beneers and Tolvanen, not bad offensively together in 60 minutes, 3.3 expected goals, three actual goals per 60 minutes. I kind of agree with you. I think that Seattle top line is my favorite line in this game. Now, I don't mind playing Eichel, Marcheseau, Barbashev. Uh, they did kick Marcheseau off the power play, which I get it because the power play hasn't been good since Mark Stone got hurt, but the power play hasn't been good since Mark Stone got hurt. doesn't matter what the top unit has been. Like, it's yeah. just one of those things. Anyway, um, Seattle won for me in this game is, is one of those, like, low-ish owned filler stacks that I like. Like, they're only 13. Th this is a fully court, again, like we talk about fully correlated top lines. And we talked about that with St. Louis earlier. This is a fully correlated top line that will probably all play around 20 minutes here tonight that is coming in at 2% ownership. So something to keep in mind if you're making a ton of lineups here tonight. It, generally speaking, I'm not targeting this game for single entry, but if I were, it would be Seattle one that I had to have the most interest in. Yeah, and they're not getting that much ownership. It's like usually Seattle's chalk, and like I kind of have interest this time, and they're not chalk, but like I want to play other lines more. It's truly, truly disturbing slate for me. 
Coming up after us, NBA Deeper Dive at 5 p.m., NBA Live Before Lock at 6 p.m., then Playback Live Stream, Watch Along at 7 p.m. That's a fun show. You should check it out if you're playing NBA. Um, Yeah, let's talk about some defensemen here. Top of the board, there's Yossi, and then everyone else is under 7K. Yossi's 8K. Dobson, Bouchard, Quinn Hughes, Darlene, Josh Morrissey. Honestly, like this is a very good uh, Noah Dobson game. Quinn Hughes in a great spot. I do worry about his peripherals. But he has been shooting the puck a bit more. Not like he was in the beginning of the season, but he went through a stretch in that middle of the season where he just was not shooting. He is shooting a bit more now, so I don't mind Quinn Hughes. Who else you like him? Yeah, um, obviously, yeah, Victor Hedman at the top of the board in that matchup. Like, I'm sorry. Like, we do really do like uh, Tampa here tonight, obviously. Uh, wrote up Seth Jones in the picks article. Like, obviously, he's been a lot more productive with Connor Bedard in the lineup. I think it's 10 points in his last 16 games, uh, averaging over three shots per game, even a block and a half per game. So don't mind Seth Jones. Um, not a terrible matchup for Evan Bouchard. Not my favorite matchup either, but – uh, Hedman Jones, and yeah, I don't mind Quinn Hughes either. Mid price range, like Justin Falk, obviously running the top power play with Tory Krug injured for St. Louis, and he's a guy that does like to shoot, and he's under 5K on DraftKings. I do like Falk uh, with no Aaron Ekblad. Gustav Forsling is fine. Um, I think Shea Theodore is fine. Going back to our buddy Yam Court from the Flyers to try to rack up some blocks, I think is fine. But this does, other than Falk and maybe Forsling, this does seem to be a stars and scrubs night on defense again for me. So uh, there are cheap guys that I do like Mike Riley uh, from the Islanders. He's popping in projections, especially on FanDuel. Um, but, you know, great matchup against Detroit. Olin Zellweger uh, still getting a lot of power play time for Anaheim. Uh, Pavel Mintyukov also getting some power play time for Anaheim. Uh, Bowen Barham, I just noticed while we were on the air, Barham got moved to the second power play unit for Buffalo. That kind of sucks, but he's probably still going to play a ton of minutes, and he's still under 4K on DraftKings. Um, I like Nemich again for New Jersey uh, for the shot blocking potential. They're also like really cheap defensemen that I like here tonight. I wrote up Nico Mikola because he's been over 20 minutes a game in the last three games uh, with no Ekblad in the lineup uh, for Florida. Uh, you know, Jalen Chatfield, I think, is fine for Carolina at 2,700. Matt Dumba, 2,800 for the Lightning. Like, all the Lightning defensemen are in play in such a good matchup. Like, if you don't want to stack Tampa, I think just playing one of their super cheap defensemen just to get some exposure to that game um, is a good thing. So I don't mind Dumba at 2,800 either. Yeah. Um, like, there is a min price. Like, Zach Jones is min price. He's been playing 15, 16 minutes. It's not the best matchup, but, like, if you really need a min price guy, at least he'll be on the ice for at least 15 minutes. That's like a, the only positive thing I could say about it. And he does like to shoot. But, yeah, I, I do agree with everyone that you said. Let's talk about some goalies here. <sighs> I hate goalies. I don't know if you guys have noticed. Uh, where's Tyler? Is Tyler here? <laughs> Who are you playing? <laughs> no, but um, I think, like, there isn't a goalie that I truly like here. Like Sorokin at 7,600, I think is fine. Um, Joel Hofer, 7,500. Don't even mind Grubauer at 7,300. Uka Pekka is kind of risky at 7,200, but he's been great this season. And uh, if you really want to uh, strap in and uh, go for a bumpy ride. Mackenzie Blackwood, 6,700. The, the one thing I would say, like, because I always say, like, anyone under 7K who sees the shot volume uh, is in play. But, like, Tampa's so efficient, you might not see the volume. So, buyer beware there. If I was spending up for a goalie, I think it would be Freddie Anderson or Bob. But I don't really love the top range here. Well, I did write up Saros in the article, but he's not starting, so we can take Saros out. Um, Joel Hofer, I agree with. We also have him projected for the most saves here tonight uh, per the goalie stats tool. He's not projected for the most goals against either, obviously, because he's playing Ottawa. Um, it's not even close. Like Blackwood, Montembeau, Urson, Uka Pekka and Kevin Lankinen, all projected for more goals against. So, yeah, I don't mind uh, Joel um, 
Joel Hofer here tonight. So Hofer, uh, for sure, uh, don't mind Reimer against the Islanders. Like, as long as Detroit's penalty kill doesn't get into trouble, Reimer should be able to make some saves at five on five. Jeremy Swayman has a really strong projection. Um, I know you don't like to stack against your Rangers, but uh, sorry. Uh, should have done I, it the other night. How about yeah, I don't I don't mind Swayman. I there is one expensive goalie I do like here tonight, and it's it's uh, Stewie Skinner. Um, not super concerned about Buffalo completely lighting him up, and you know Edmonton doesn't give up a lot of shots a, a lot of the time, but Buffalo has also been having a lot of trouble scoring. So uh, you know maybe this is one of those like two goals and 26 shots with the win type games um, for Skinner. So I don't mind Skinner as an expensive goalie here tonight. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think I've, I can count on one hand the times I've paid 8,300 and up for a goalie this season. Just what I do, you know, it's, you know, I could be wrong. I'm wrong a lot. Who are you liking for your hat trick pick? Um, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this one. I'm going with Braden Shed. I mean, listen, I I could laugh at it, but then you can just – you have the trump card on me. I said Mikhail Granlin one time. <laughs> so, like, no matter what you say, nothing will ever be as bad as that. That's true. I'm going Troy Terry. All right. Uh, there we go. A winger from a, a lottery team and a winger from a non-playoff team, neither of whom shoot very much. Both your hat trick picks on an 11-game slate. That's why we get paid the big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, Make sure to get into Discord to find out who Tyler's playing in net. Uh, it is uh, very important. <laughs> Your slate hinges on it. Um, but, yeah, we will be back on Saturday. Uh, thank you for the super chats, the support, and uh, good luck, everybody, tonight. Good luck tonight, everybody.